so Mr. Peek, I read that statement as well, and I'm still up a little confused. Are you endorsing Donald Trump? Look, if you're not, what is holding you back? And do you really have a choice? I mean, look, you're the, not voting for Hillary Clinton. The, endorsing the process of, of unifying the Republican Party, which just finished a primary about a week ago, perhaps one of the most divisive primaries in memory, takes some time. Look, there are people who are for Donald Trump, who are for Ted Cruz, or for John Kasich, who are for Marco Rubio and everybody else. And it's very important that we don't uh, fake unifying, we don't pretend unification, that we truly and actually unify so that we are full strength in the fall. I don't want us to have a fake unification process here. I want to make sure that we really truly understand each other and that we are committed to the conservative principles that make the Republican Party, that built this country. And again, I, I, I'm very encouraged. I I heard a lot of good things from our presumptive nominee, and we exchanged differences of opinion on a number of things that, you know, everybody knows we have. There are policy disputes that we will have. There's no two ways about it. Plenty of Republicans disagree with one another on policy disputes, but on core principles. Those are the kinds of things that we discuss. And again, I'm encouraged. All right, that was Paul Ryan, 25 now till the top of the hour. Toll free, our number is 800-941-SEAN. You want to be a part of the program responding to what Paul Ryan has been saying and doing and not endorsing is Patrick J. Buchanan, who joins us now. His headline in his latest column is Pat Buchanan, who promoted Private Ryan. Ouch, how are you? Doing fine, Sean. How are you? I'm good. Well, I understand. I'm a, I was more annoyed. I'm less annoyed now, more mildly annoyed at, at Paul Ryan for doing this. Uh, when he first mentioned it, I said, well, maybe we won't support you for speaker. And that p- got picked up by a lot of people. To me, after a year and some odd months of, of campaigning, you would think he knows what Trump's positions are now and what part of him does he disagree with. He should just come forward with it. Well, that's, <clears throat> that's correct. And uh, Ryan does disagree, for example. Donald Trump is an economic nationalist who would put the reindustrialization of America ahead of any free trade ideology. And Paul Ryan's a free trade ideologue. But, Sean, the point here is Donald Trump is not asking Paul Ryan to give up any belief or any policy position or stance he's got. He has won the nomination. And the simple question is, Are you gonna, is Paul Ryan going to endorse the Republican nominee? Is he going to take a pass and sit this out, or is he going to endorse Hillary Rodham Clinton. Well, I think he's trying to flex his muscles and try and negotiate some kind of deal with with Trump. There, look, there are three things, three issues that I see they have disagreement on. One, you nailed it, trade. Number two, the 11 million people that are here illegally, whether to send them back. And the third one would be touching entitlements. Now, Paul Ryan believes that we, we cannot get to a balanced budget without dealing with entitlement reform. I actually think probably over time, seeing the numbers, Trump might make some adjustments to that. But Those are the only three issues. I I would believe he wants to fix the VA. I would believe he wants to rebuild the military. I would believe he wants health care savings accounts. Uh, I would believe that he wants the wall built. Maybe not, because Republicans haven't done it, so there's a question mark there. Uh, I would believe on is this. Who is Paul Ryan to ask Donald Trump to alter or compromise positions which he took and he articulated and he fought for and which won him the Republican nomination. Upon what ground does this our Caesar, or upon what meat does this our Caesar feed? I mean, look, what he's asking Trump to do is to compromise the positions Trump told the American people he would hold and defend and, and basically and enact. And anyone in Ryan, anyone, Pat. On Paul Ryan's part of Donald Trump. And I don't, I mean, I'm glad Trump was very gracious to him. But he shouldn't make any concessions to Paul Ryan. Look, Mr. Ryan's got a choice. As I said, he can endorse, not endorse, or go with Hillary. No, I think that's the choice. I think that's it. Now, what area, for example, the Trump people say that they're going to announce the pool of candidates that they would use to pick for the Supreme Court. I would think if if Donald Trump was serious in only appointing originalists, constitutionalists like Scalia and Justice Thomas, then I've got to believe that that list might be just enough for every conservative on that one issue to push them over the top. I mean, but Trump has never indicated he would do otherwise. I mean, every conservative just about I know admires admired the late Justice Scalia and would like to see men like him and Thomas and Alito appointed to the Supreme Court. 
And I think Trump, is, he ought to try to unite the party. He ought to reach out. And he ought to say, look, we're going to talk to Federalist Society guys. There are a lot of people in the Republican Party, conservative movement, for whom this is the first issue. We're going to bring those guys on a committee and give us a list of judges for federal appellate court and for the U.S. Supreme Court. And I will certainly be looking at that. And I very probably will be drawing from it. No problem. Yeah, look, if, and if he lists those names and says, this is the pool of people I'm going to consider and nobody else, and it is a conservative list and a list that people would admire, from what I hear, they have been asking groups like the Federalist and the Heritage Foundation and other groups. I wouldn't lock myself into something like that because, you know, uh, frankly, you know, I have, I know Ted Cruz and he, Lion Ted and all that, but I wouldn't mind seeing Ted Cruz pointed to the U.S. Supreme Court. If, but I wouldn't I mind at all. Interested. I think he sees his career politically and in electoral politics. But there are members of the United States Senate who I would be happy to see. What on about the US Mike Supreme Lee? Court. How about Mike Lee? Exactly. Mike yeah, Lee's good, but, but my nephew works for him. We don't want to lose his job. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find him another job, Pat. I think he could probably work for you in your old no, age. He's an outstanding senator. He's doing a fine job. And but that's exactly the type of person is someone who you know, many Democrats would also say, look, Mike Lee's a good guy. They're, they're going to appoint conservatives, and, and, it's, and it's they won the election. It's their turn. We go along with him. What do you think about a team of rivals? In other words, you bring in Newt Gingrich, you bring in Rudy Giuliani, you bring in Chris Christie, you bring in Rick I Perry. I, let me agree with you, Sean. I really believe, you know, the Republican field of candidates was not all that impressive when they got up in the... NFL, if you will, presidential politics. But there are 10 or 12 or more people in those Republican primaries and caucuses who are outstanding in their states and who would fill out a cabinet extremely well and whom you'd be delighted to have there. Rudy Giuliani is, I mean, I disagree with him on social issues, but you know, as a, uh, as an attorney general or, or the governor Chris Christie as an attorney general is fine by me. That would be fine by me, too. One could be the chairman or the secretary of uh, Homeland Security. I think that would put fear in the hearts of our enemies and give comfort to Americans to know that finally we're going to have somebody that recognizes uh, modern-day evil. You can put, you know, why not Dr. Ben Carson to overhaul Obamacare? We have new numbers out today that show how disastrous this thing is and and how expensive it has gotten and how many companies have bailed out. He could be the Secretary of Health and Human Services. There's got to be a place for Rick Perry. There's got to be a place for Bobby Jindal. There's got to be a place for either Susanna Martinez or Nikki Haley. I mean, these people have done great jobs, or Scott Walker or Marco Rubio, for that matter. uh, Although I think Nikki Haley... (laughs) Might have uh, might have gotten on the wrong side of the Donald, but everyone there you mentioned, you're right. Or they, I don't think anybody in the city of Washington D.C. would uh, would really sharply contest almost any of those appointments as being perfectly qualified individuals. They seem to have a lot of energy. Many of them are traditionalist conservatives. They don't have the the Donald's views on trade or or immigration, maybe or or even on foreign policy. But on domestic, a lot of domestic policies and small government issues, I think they'd all be fine. Yeah. You know, who do you like for VP? I'm just curious if you could pick one person. I wouldn't. Uh, I think we went around once on this before, Sean. I wouldn't pick one out because I wouldn't want to, you know, I just wouldn't want to say so. But there, are, it's a tough call in this. All right. Let, let me put it this way. I think Rubio's out and I think Kasich is out. Now to pick. Well, here's what I would consider. Number one, you've got to win the presidency of the United States. Number two, he's got to be qualified if something happens to you one day and you're no longer here to sit in that chair and run the foreign policy and the defense policy of the United States. Most of us think these fellows are fine on domestic policy. You need that, or you can need someone who can bring you a decisive state. You need someone, I think, who's going to be compatible with you. And uh, and there's other attributes, and Trump has mentioned himself, someone who can work with him on the, in, on Capitol Hill, sort of a Biden type for uh, Barack Obama. So there's a lot of considerations, and uh, and uh, you know, and someone. And so you're you're going to punt again. You're going to you're going to punt. For outsiders. You know, the funny thing is, is you've never punted in your whole life. You're punting. Well, no, I'm, no. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if it were me, I'd have no trouble picking him, but I'm not picking for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. But you like, what do you think about this? I um, I like the idea because every, every exit poll showed 65 percent 
of Americans feel betrayed by Republicans. The Republicans feel betrayed by their own party in D.C. I think the idea of putting down on paper 10 ideas, and here's my 10 ideas, balance the budget, stop stealing from future generations, build the wall, protect American jobs, and protect the homeland, two. Three, repeal Obamacare, uh, replace with health care savings accounts. Four, make America energy independent, drilling, coal, fracking, nuclear, new technology. Five, fix America's trade imbalance and demand trade fairness. That's a Trump uh, position. Six, destroy ISIS and radical Islamic groups that are declared war against America. Seven, rebuild America's military like Reagan did. Eight, fix our broken VA and take care of American heroes. Nine, end Common Core and send education back to the states. And ten, undo Obama's executive orders. Mm-hmm. How's that? Well, I'm, that's a, that's what a am good I missing? List, but you don't have Paul Ryan's uh, reform uh, the entitlements. Uh, that's not what the president's running on. <laughs> You're exactly right. It's not what he's running on. Look, but my own view has been rare, is. Uh, then, you know, don't write things down all the time. But I do agree with that list, basically. I might edit it a bit in terms of, you know, on the trade policy, my view is that, look, don't worry about the, the, the trade is a means to an end. The end goal is the reindustrialization of America, restoring America's economic independence and self-sufficiency, which we had in the 19th, we've had for our entire life almost uh, since the Civil War, Restore that, reindustrialize the country, and, and the trade policy should be designed around the goal, which is reindustrialize America, make us self-sufficient. Well, I love the idea of bringing jobs back to America, but look, That's for example, doing. I think a strong case could be made. I mean, look, I understand Americans want cheap products. I know that China provides them, but it also has destroyed our manufacturing centers, and our factory towns now have become ghost towns. Sean, Sean how, did we re, how did we first industrialize from the Civil War all the way up through World War II when we had the highest wages on Earth? It's quite simple. You put a tariff on manufactured goods coming into the country. 20% tariff will get you $500 billion. Take the revenue and make American companies more competitive by eliminating the corporate income tax. And if you mm-hmm. can't do the whole thing, do it for every small business in America and cut the corporate income tax on the larger businesses to the where they're the lowest in the competitive world. Bring the companies back into the United States. That Listen, the it. first thing the first thing we ought to do on that front is there are not billions, but trillions of dollars overseas, multinational corporations. They park the money overseas in tax haven countries because they can't bring it back to the United States because the government's going to take 40 percent. The state will, the state will take well, that's, another 10 percent. That's the folly of that's, it, see? That's the fault. But, but here, let them bring it back at a 5 percent one-time tax. I would trillions do that, of dollars. Here's the other thing. The reason why I say don't tax corporations yeah. Big, every corporation in the world passes it on to the its consumer. Orders and its production in the United States. Yeah. That's well, they we also want. listen. Corporations don't pay taxes. Exactly. People well, got to remember this. Tell me that in the White House, Pat. Oh. Corporations don't pay taxes. The they PJB don't because they pass it on to us. When I pay taxes for that, where do you think it comes from? <laughs> comes from you paying higher prices exactly. for goods you and mean, services. I, it comes right out of what I earned. Yeah. All right, so what do you think is going to happen? Is he going to win? Trump going to win? I think Trump's got a shot at it, and I'm, I tell you, I'm very impressed with the tightness of these polls. One of them had him two points, and then you got Trump doing well in these states, uh, the you know, like Ohio and Florida and uh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, yeah. There's a real possibility, but I'll tell you what I'm concerned about is this really could get a uh, the muddiest thing, uh, the muddiest track they've ever run a derby on. <laughs> no, listen, I don't think there's any doubt. This is going to be one ugly campaign. You just, there's nothing you can do. It's, well, you know, it's just, what's sad about it, I almost wish you'd have a, a disarmament agreement that with Bill and Hill, and the and the enabler and Bill's antics and yeah. uh, oh my Donald's gosh, you just, youth and all the rest of it. And then you got James the Comey. Let's talk about the economy yeah. and defense and building up this country and securing the border and all I the I got to run, Pat. Then we all right, Patrick J. Buchanan, thank you.